Hi, and welcome to the CBI. Today I'm going to be talking about whether or not there's a corporate governance clientele effect. According to the theory of clientele effects, we essentially think that a company's stock price is going to move in reaction to a particular policy change that affects a particular firm. So under the clientele effect theory, we assume that different types of investors are, are attracted to different types of firms with different types of policies. And that when a particular firm's policy changes, investors that like that policy will actually sell their shares in that particular company and move elsewhere, which should result in a decline in that company's stock price. So for example, when researchers study the, the dividend clientele effect, they're assuming that certain types of investors are attracted to firms with high dividends. And if these, these firms start to cut their dividends or to completely cease paying dividends altogether, we would expect to find those investors with preferences for dividends to actually shift their investments to other firms that offer them higher dividend payouts. And as a result, the initial firms who made the change in policy will see their stock prices decline. So the question I'm interested in today relates to whether or not there's a corporate governance clientele effect. So in the study that I'm going to describe to you today, I'm actually exploring the question of whether or not different types of investors, and here I'm interested in institutional investors versus retail or individual investors, whether different types of investors have preferences for well-governed firms. So it's important to note that in this study that I'm going to talk about today, I'm not actually testing whether or not changes in governance lead to changes in stock prices or in investor behavior. I'm only evaluating preferences at this stage. So researchers Ki Chung and Hao Zhang actually find that higher proportions of institutional investor ownership are actually associated with higher quality governance. And in order to engage in their study, they use as a metric for corporate go governance quality the corporate governance quotient that's put forth by Institutional Shareholder Services, or ISS. ISS is a leading proxy advisory firm that, that's very influential in the activities of corporations. Large institutions look to ISS for advice on how to, vi on, on how to vote in major corporate e election matters, and they also look to them to help them figure out which firms are well governed and which firms are not by using this corporate governance quotient. Now, this particular metric is controversial. There are lots of different studies which actually question whether or not having a higher corporate governance quotient leads to higher firm value. And there are competing metrics out there as well. But this is the metric that is most commonly used and referred to in this literature. And this is the one used by the study that I'm talking about today, as well as my own study. This Corporate Governance Quotient, or CGQ, actually uses firm disclosures. So these are all, all of the companies that are being evaluated are publicly traded firms who are required to actually dis disclose their, their governance practices. So these CGQs are developed by ISS for publicly traded companies using public firm disclosures. And it looks at things that are related to both internal governance and external governance. Along the dimension of internal governance, we're looking at things such as board composition, what percentage of the directors on a board of directors are independent. We're also looking at shareholder rights. Do shareholders have the right to call special meetings? Can shareholders act via written consent? The idea here is that the more independent of, of a board is, the more active shareholders are able to be, the better governed the firm will be, and hopefully we'll see that translate into higher firm value and into less opportunities for managers to engage in fraud or abuse. The ISS CGQ also has certain factors within its metric that examine external governance. And by external governance, I refer to exposure to the market for corporate control. By the market for corporate control, I'm talking about a particular firm's susceptibility to being the subject of a hostile takeover attempt and the likelihood of success of such an attempt. So the market for corporate control is considered to also be a mechanism for providing governance or for disciplining management. The idea here is that if a management team knows that it's subject to a hostile takeover, it has more incentive to act in ways that will maximize firm value because firms that are poorly managed or that have low, low values relative to their potential are more likely to be subject to hostile takeover 
attempts. So if we have managers that are subject to the market for corporate control, they'll act in ways that are consistent with maximizing firm value and not consistent in ways that expropriate firm value through excessive executive compensation or shirking or other types of things that we're worried about managers engaging in. So the CGQ actually is primarily focused on internal governance metrics, but it also has a few elements of external governance. So the idea here is these researchers actually found that institutional investors appear to be attracted to firms that are well governed according to the CGQ metric. And through an econometric te technique, they actually have de determined that there appear to be preferences by institutional investors for well-governed firms, and that it's not merely a case of reverse causality, where the presence of institutional investors and their activism makes, make firms actually adopt better governance practices. So essentially, this finding that higher proportions of institutional ownership are associated with higher governance quality sort of makes intuitive sense to us. As we think of retail investors generally as being passive investors, it's normally not worth the effort of a small investor to monitor the companies in which they invest. Now, institutional investors, on the other hand, because of their higher ownership stakes, and particularly in cases when it's costly to exit, they have more incentive than retail investors to monitor the management teams of the companies in which they invest. If you express a preference and you can actually find investments in firms that are already well governed, that can reduce your own monitoring costs, thereby making these types of investments attractive to institutional owners. So in this study, I actually try to go a step beyond and see whether or not there is a corporate governance clientele effect consistent with past research. And my study differs from the study I mentioned to you just a moment ago in that in addition to assessing the relationship between governance quality and institutional versus retail ownership, I also assess the relationship between governance quality and retail versus, in, versus institutional investor purchases of shares over a 17-month study period. So I'm interested in looking not just at the static proportion of ownership by one particular class of investors versus another, I'm also looking to see over a 17-month period what percentage of shares in each individual firm were purchased by retail investors versus institutional investors. I believe that looking at purchases gives us a little more information because we're at least seeing conscious buying decisions by retail investors and institutions over a certain period of time, whereas ownership can actually reflect preferences that may have since changed over some period of time. And also, we also know that retail investors often inherit stock or they just have a couple of shares that may have come from sources other than through their active determination that this was a company in which they'd like to make an investment. The second way in which my study differs from the prior study is that I examine the quality of corporate governance by looking at both internal governance, as I've defined it before, matters such as board composition, and I also look at external governance, meaning exposure to the market for corporate control. So the ISS CGQ has elements of both. So I use the CGQ for my internal governance metric since it's primarily composed of those types of elements, but I also break out the internal governance metrics from the external governance metrics. There's also an alternative metric that I use as a proxy for high quality external governance, and that's a metric that was first introduced in 2003 by Gompers, Ishii, and Metric known as the GIM or GIM index. And in this particular context, we're looking to see how shareholder rights operate within a particular firm. So under the GIM index, having a lower score implies higher quality external corporate governance. This is because every time there's a particular element or practice at a firm that reduces shareholder rights, such as the presence of a poison pill or the presence of a staggered board, or shareholders not being able to act on written consent, we actually give, this index actually gives that firm an additional point. So having fewer points means that you're more exposed to the market for corporate control, which we think implies higher corporate governance. I also in this study actually examine the relationship between 
institutional and retail ownership and trading on the, on the one hand and the incidence of securities fraud over a prior 10-year period. Essentially, when we're using corporate governance metrics, we're trying to find proxies for the types of behave, behaviors that enhance firm value or that avoid, to the extent possible, catastrophe or things that are likely to diminish firm, firm value. Because we generally think that the presence of securities fraud is something that represents a serious governance breakdown, I think that's also something that's worthwhile looking at in this context. So I'm trying to figure out whether or not institutions versus retail investors care more about the instance, the incidence of fraud. So in my study, like Chong and Zhang, I find that higher quality corporate governance measured primarily by the emphasis on internal governance metrics done by ISS's CGQ, which as I mentioned heavily weights internal governance factors, it's associated with a higher proportion of institutional <coughs> ownership. So this finding is actually consistent with the presence of a corporate governance clientele effect. And for the reasons that I mentioned earlier, we have reason to actually think that institutions might prefer well-governed firms, and so this finding actually makes some intuitive sense to us. What I find, how, however, is that the, the relationship between governance quality and shareholder base is flipped when we measure corporate governance quality by looking at the external corporate governance metric or the GIM index. There I find that higher quality corporate governance is associated with higher levels of retail investor trading and ownership. Now this result is puzzling. It doesn't really stand to reason that we can say that retail investors should have an expressed preference for firms that have more exposure to the market for corporate control and that institutional investors actually prefer the opposite. They actually want their firms to have more poison pills in place and more staggered boards in place. So this led me to think that perhaps what's going on here is not really a corporate governance clientele effect, but rather what I'm finding is the presence of a managerial response to the shareholder base that it's given. And the possibility that the presence of retail investors can act as a partial substitute for anti-takeover measures. Now it's generally believed by investor relations professionals and by managers generally that retail investors are more loyal to management than their institutional <coughs> counterparts. And when we're actually thinking about when this loyalty is most likely to be relevant, it's when we're talking about battles for corporate control. When we're talking about when a hostile bidder emerges and tries to get investors to tender their shares into a hostile tender offer, investor loyalty matters and will determine in close contest what the outcome of this tender offer would be. Also when we see proxy fights or contests for corporate control or control of the board of directors, in close cases, if shareholders are more loyal to management, that's, that means it's more likely that shareholders will vote with management and that incumbent management will be able to maintain their position on the board of directors, making contests for corporate control less likely to be successful. Now there's been research done in the past that seems to suggest that beyond just what we hear commonly from investor relations professionals, that actually managers actually do target their shareholder base. They actually have people who focus on going to various types of con conferences, cultivating relationships with different types of investors. And one study actually found that almost half of executives surveyed actually say that the threat of a hostile takeover will make them more likely to take a closer look at the composition of their shareholder base. And they admit that if they are more concerned about being subject to a hostile takeover, they're more likely to try to increase the ownership by retail investors generally and their employees in particular because insiders, as is probably obvious to, to most of us, are the most likely investors to be the most loyal. So if we think that it's possible that retail investors can focus or can serve rather as a substitute for anti-takeover measures. One way to try to assess whether or not this theory is plausible is to try to figure out the context in which retail investors are most likely to be loyal to management. 
And one context that I use in this study to evaluate this looks at the context of paying dividends. Generally, we think that retail investors are more loyal because they don't have the staff that an institutional investor, a fund manager, would actually have to make individual assessments of whether or not you should vote a certain way in a contest for corporate control. And management's been nice to them in the past. Things have been going pretty, pretty well. There's no reason to jump ship. One way to engender even more loyalty and to have retail investors be even more likely to side with management in a contest for corporate control could be in cases where the retail investors are actually receiving a quarterly dividend check. We actually think that shareholders are thinking, well, things are going just fine. I get my quarterly dividend check every, every few, few months, so there's no real reason to, rock the to actually rock the boat. So in my study, I actually divide my sample into firms that pay dividends and firms that don't pay dividends. And my results, meaning my overall results, where I find that internal governance quality is associated with higher levels of institutional ownership and trading, but external governance quality is associated with higher levels of retail investor ownership and trading. Those results only hold at a statistically significant level for the portion of my sample where the firms include only those firms that pay dividends. So this leads, us, leads me to think that perhaps there is something to this notion that investor loyalty is driving this result and maybe managers actually do think that retail investors can act as partial substitutes for anti-takeover measures. Now, of course, if we examine this issue more closely, and for those of you that have taken corporation law or mergers and acquisitions, you might be familiar with the Delaware case law and the jurisprudence in this area when we're talking about hostile takeover measures, there seems to be this underlying theme that retail investors are subject to being taken advantage of. That maybe retail investors would jump at the first opportunity to get a takeover premium if management weren't allowed to actually put mechanisms in place to make it more difficult for them to be swayed by what appears to be a high premium offer. So essentially, whether or not retail investors are more likely to be swayed or not is an empirical matter, and one that I'll try to test further on as I continue with this project. But even if you don't believe that retail investors are more loyal, there still are a couple of other ways whereby we might think that the presence of a, a largely, a shareholder base consisting largely of retail investors might, say, might serve as a substitute for anti-takeover -take measures. One relates to the difficulty of winning a contest for corporate control when you have a large retail shareholder base. So when you have dispersed shareholders, theories have been set forth which actually say that it's more difficult to wage a successful proxy contest because you have to convince a largely dispersed group of individual shareholders to vote in favor of change. You have to get them to vote in favor of the status quo. And research has shown that management has a competitive advantage in these contexts when you're talking about a widely dispersed set of shareholders. Management can use the firm's resources to tell its story to shareholders. Management has access to stockholder lists. And the insurgent can get access to all of this, but it's much more difficult. Management has a more difficult management has an easier time, rather, of being able to tell its story to its shareholders because they've developed some relationship with their shareholders over the years. And they have experience actually navigating the complicated proxy process. There are also structural impediments to insurgents in the proxy contest context because managers get to set meeting times and, <laughs> uh, and uh, agendas and are, gen and are generally more able to put up roadblocks to insurgents which make us generally think that managers have an advantage in proxy contests generally, and that these advantages are magnified when we have a largely dispersed group of retail shareholders who may not be paying as much attention. Now this leads me to the third way in which retail investors as shareholders might actually lead to, a partial, to being partial substitutes for anti-takeover measures. And here I'm talking about retail investor passivity. The general idea that relative to institutional investors, retail investors just don't pay as much attention. So when they do vote, we think that they tend to be more loyal to management. 
but many of them do not vote at all. And they simply do not exercise their right to vote. And if a hostile takeover attempt is embarked on by a hostile bidder, in order to gain control of the target firm, the hostile bidder has to actually convince a majority or the holders of a majority of the shares in a particular firm to tender their shares into the offer. So the more retail investors you have, assuming again that we think that retail investors are more passive, the more likely you are to have dead shares that are not going to be tendered anywhere at all and they're going to be floating out there and not even subject to the arguments that the hostile bidder might make with respect to why the hostile bidder can offer more value than the incumbent management team. So all things being equal, if you have <coughs> passive shareholders and you need to get not just more shareholders voting yes versus no, but you actually have to get a majority of the shares overall to tender into the offer, having more passive retail investors might actually make it more difficult for an insurgent campaign to be successful. So of course one natural question flows from this analysis. If we actually think that retail investors might actually serve as an anti-takeover mechanism, why do we think that this might be a substitute for anti-takeover measures as opposed to just a complement? Even if a firm has a large retail shareholder base, why not just have your large retail shareholder base and just substitute or, or rather add on to that with additional anti-takeover measures like poison pills and staggered boards. So the answer to this question is not one that I can answer definitively, but one possibility is that generally the institutional investor community is hostile to the presence of anti-takeover measures. Certainly the ISS CGQ penalizes firms for having anti-takeover measures in place. So it's possible that a firm might opt not to draw attention to itself by putting into place things like poison pills and staggered boards when they know they're going to immediately suffer a reputational hit in the investment co community and instead to opt for the protection that they perceive to be in place because of the composition of their shareholder base. So with that, I will stop and take any questions that you might have. Yes. Yes, I have two questions. First, I'm, I'm a bit surprised that you find it puzzling that a retail investor would actually prefer a firm which have a higher possibility of takeover. Because if I'm a retail in investor and I know that this firm is starting to take over and maybe even in the near future, it makes it a, actually quite a good investment mechanism because if I invest it and uh, someone come and take over and, over and offer a premium, maybe the actual value of the share is higher. But from my perspective as a retail investor, I can cash out an immediate premium over my purchase price. So as a retail investor who looking just to make, who, who look for profit, it seems, I, I actually thought that it would be quite intuitive that a retail investor will opt for such a mechanic, such a firm. Now my next question is, I, I like your argument that having a big retail investor base is a good complement to an anti takeover measure. So I'm wondering, could you just test it by looking at the changes in the anti takeover? So you have the list, the, the index, and you, you can actually monitor the change, whether it increase or decrease, and then look at the firm to see is there a corresponding change in investor composition. So if if you can if you find that when the, the index actually lower, making it more likely for take formally, make it more likely for takeover, actually correspond with an increase in retail investor. I think that really drive the point and prove your point. All right, okay. So you've asked two questions. So, so the first is you said, well, you couldn't quite figure out why I found it puzzling that there's an association between the level of retail investor trading and ownership and external governance quality. Because you said as an individual investor, you'd find it quite attractive to invest in a firm that had fewer anti-takeover defenses in place, because that means pretty shortly after you make your in investment, there's a possibility for you being able to, to sell your shares at a, at, a, at a premium. Even if that's not the highest value possible over the long term, you can engage in a quick flip. So I guess my response sort of centers on a couple of things. First, we have to assume that retail investors actually know which firms in their portfolios have poison pills and staggered boards 
which firms allow shareholders to call special meetings, which shareholders, which firms allow their shareholders to act by written consent, which sharehold, which firms are incorporated in states, which have business combination statutes, which ones aren't, which ones are in fair price states. And so that's a lot of information that we think it's very hard for retail investors to keep track of. Even institutions sometimes have a hard time keeping track of it, but they do subscribe to these corporate governance services that are provided by ISS. And that's one, one mechanism for us thinking that, that institutions just might have better information about this than retail investors. But even if we assume that retail investors do have perfect information, they can figure all of, all of these things out, we have to ask why a retail investor would be more attractive to a takeover premium and the possibility of a takeover premium than an institutional investor. We know that trading activity differs among institutions and retail investors. Outside of the, the, the anecdotes we hear about the crazy day trader, generally retail investors only make a handful of trades throughout the year. They tend to be buy and hold investors. In, institutions trade quite a bit. They are in and out of stocks a lot. So if we thought one group versus the other were, were more interested in making a quick profit, we might think it would be the opposite, right? And so um, it's, it's, it's not, I'm, I'm certain that there are some investors who do prefer to sell out quickly, but it's not clear to me that we can categorize them as being retail versus institutional. And now your, your second question is actually the one that I said I didn't address in this study, um, which is just sort of taking the notion of the corporate governance clientele effect one step further. So I've said in this study, I'm merely looking at whether or not we can ascertain whether or not there are preferences. Now you're saying, well, why don't you go to the next step, which is what the dividend clientele effect literature does, which is say, okay, we have reasons to think that there might be preferences. Let's see if stockholders actually do change their ownership following a corporate governance change. So there have been some studies that have, oh, I'm sorry. Could your theory suggest that manager would change the company governance in response to its shareholder base? So it is not. It's not about shareholder changing, but because your theory, mm -hmm. am I correct to say that your theory is about manager changing right. its practices in response right. to a, a surge in retail? So, right. so, so the question is, do you, it's easy to show that, to prove your theory, if you can show right. that managers in response to a surge in retail, right. or maybe a decrease in retail investor, changes their corporate governance practice in terms of takeover. Right. Yeah, so actually the opposite way would have been an easier study to in, engage in, sort of showing changes in firm practices, and people have done similar things in the past. So that's what I was about to answer, but your question's right. So my theory is managers, because they have the shareholder base they are given, they actually make decisions about whether or not they are, they're going to put a poison pill in place or whether or not they're going to have a staggered board. What makes it difficult to analyze that in this context is, Corporate governance changes tend not to happen that rapidly. The shareholder base composition doesn't change that rapidly either. So if you're a firm that largely has a retail investor shareholder base, it might change a little bit, of course, because in investor relations professionals are always trying to market and they're trying to change the composition. But, but we don't see dramatic enough changes for us to figure out um, whether or not we see a change in managerial behavior. Now, if there were some way to sort of see if there's some sort of shock to the shareholder base, like if, for example, the firm started, started an ESOP, for example, and then all of a sudden we saw 15% of, of the company shares suddenly be in the hands of, of, of insiders. We can see if over some period of time a firm changed its corporate governance practices. But usually what happens is Firms actually at the time of their initial public offerings, most of them already have their primary takeover defenses in place. Like studies have, have, have shown that sort of depending upon the time period, anywhere from 44% to 88% of firms that are going to have a staggered board have them at the time they go public and it's in the charter and investors invest in that firm and it pretty much just stays that way. And it doesn't actually change that rapidly. But I do agree that if I could come up with a test that were credible, and, and that if I could actually show some changes, that would bolster my theory. 
dividends uh, factoring into the retailer loyalty, do you find that that, uh, that uh, change happens across the board with, with all uh, corporations, or is that limited to a certain group of institutions that are maybe not fledgling, but then not like a, right. you know, right. an Apple or something that uh, maybe <coughs> retail loyalty to Apple would be different because of its scale than uh, a smaller, you know, more mid-sized corporation. Right, so I've done, I actually, I had these slides here in case some of these issues came up. So essentially in my study, I've used as my sample 1,129 firms that trade only on the New York Stock Exchange. So I'm, I'm already talking about fairly large companies because they're NYSE listed. And the reason my, my sample is limited to NYSE firms is because this is the only data source for purchases and sales of shares that breaks it down by retail investor versus institutional in, investor. So certainly one of the issues with, with my study is I'm dealing with large NYSE firms, and as you can see, my average market capitalization is $8.3 billion. So we're not talking about small, small firms. Now what I've tried to do, though, I think your question is, well, do we see other elements of loyalty? Is it more than just dividends? Can we think maybe, is there something to be said for retail investors maybe being more loyal to a certain type of firm, maybe a consumer products firm that everyone's heard of? So I do have control variables here that look at you know, news coverage, which sort of might affect whether or not a retail investor has you know, heard of a certain firm and whether or not that might motivate them to invest one way or the other. But here I've sort of really looked at how these control variables affect the likelihood of, even, of either an institution or a retail investor being more likely to invest. I haven't explored the question of whether or not there are other aspects of loyalty, and it sort of sounds as though you're encouraging me to say, well, why don't you look at consumer products companies and maybe separate out your sample, not by dividend payers versus non-dividend payers, but also look at firms that are in particular types of industries and see whether or not this same relationship holds. And so that's something I could certainly do. Was on that answering your question? Um, you mentioned that the, the prior study on corporate governance um, did some analyses to exclude reverse causation effects, which is, which is great, but did you also, or did they exclude institutional owners above a certain percentage threshold who might have a, a direct influence on the board or, or the company itself and, and things like that? Right, so in my study and their study, we actually do control for block holders. So there's a question, so that's what that 5% ownership number means. And so you can actually get, get data on whether or not you have the presence of a controlling shareholder. And so that was something that was controlled for. But I, was, was that the whole point of your question or did, did you have yeah, a different that, that concern? Was. Okay. Yes. Do you believe that institutional investors disproportionately prefer better governance and are willing to act on that in a way that they would purchase shares? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that actually end up creating a perverse incentive for management because they would say, if we prefer, by and large, these retail investors that are more loyal, we actually want to have less good governance and attract more of those guys. All right, so do we have a perverse incentive? If, if you know that institutional investors look at the CGQ index, the corporate governance index, and say, these are the firms that I prefer, and that's where the institutional investors will put their dollars. And if managers think that institutional investors are not going to be loyal in a contest for corporate control. Doesn't that lead them to say, well, I want to get the lowest corporate governance score possible, so I'll have more retail investors who will therefore be loyal to me and I can do whatever I want to do. So there are a couple of issues. So one relates to sort of where the firm operates in the, in the marketplace. There are some firms that are so large that if you don't have institutional investors willing to invest in your shares, you're, you're not going to have anyone able to actually buy your stock. And so even if on the margin you might express a slight preference for retail investors, you can't just say we don't want institutions at all. But I, I do take your you know, basic point. We also have to sort of think about, so if that's the case, if, if we think that managers actually say, well, it's great that we can have more retail investors, that'll really protect us from the market for corporate control, 
they're actually perhaps doing something un unless we imagine a scenario whereby we have a management team that really is a good, good management team. They won't shirk, they won't engage in fraud, they won't expropriate firm value. They are really good managers, but they've decided that they're going to try to appear to be bad to game the CGQ system. Then maybe we can see where that might actually work because if they have low governance scores and it's because the firm really is poorly managed, that's going to show up in the firm's returns and that's going to make them even more susceptible to being a target of a hostile takeover bid. And the more undervalued the firm is, the more incentive hostile bidders have to even engage in the takeover attempt. So even if retail investors make it perhaps less likely that that kind of effort would actually succeed, if we actually see that you're so undervalued that there's even more enthusiasm, there's more incentive to go after you, that incentive and that enthusiasm to offer such a high premium might actually overcome the retail investor loyalty that I'm theorizing here is a factor. Are there any other questions? Yes. So in your model, and, and I'm sure you, sure you do this, but we haven't seen how you're, how you're estimating it. So what you're showing is basically that strong internal governance will lead to more institutional investors. Is it possible that the causation goes the other way? And if the causation goes the other way, that strong, that lots of institutional investors lead to strong internal, how are you teasing that out of your model? All right, so essentially all I've shown so far is that there's a correlation between the level of institutional investor ownership and, and the quality of corporate governance. So I've shown that higher institutional ownership and trading is associated with higher internal corporate governance. And the prior study that I referenced actually engaged in instrumental variable estimation. And by using that econometric te technique, they actually did the two-stage least squares regression and they actually s saw that there was some reason for us to believe that causality actually didn't run only from the presence of shareholders improving governance, but also there appeared to be a preference. The problem is I'm not, and I'm, I'm, I hate that this is being recorded, I'm not a big fan of their instruments, and that's one of the biggest issues because I have another project where I'm looking at the relationship between retail investor trading and share price accuracy. And the biggest part of that project was coming up with a good instrument. And you have to have an instrument that, that works, that satisfies various kinds of criteria. And I'm not clear, it's not clear to me that they've done that yet. And so I haven't come up with, with, with my own instrument either. But that's the next phase of this project is can I come up with an, with an instrument that also makes me confident that, that I can say that it's not exclusively reverse causality. It's very likely both. So it's unlikely that it's all one or the other. Um, but at least with an instrument, I can, I can make that claim a lot more strongly. So one, one thing to, to take from this is the notion that the retail investors are in some sense not just less sophisticated, but they make mistake, that they, mistakes. They are willing to be loyal to firms that are not giving them return in the sense that return is, to the extent that good corporate governance guarantees better returns, these retail investors are falling for firms, they are loyal to firms that are not the, not the best quality firms, and uh, uh, so do you believe that in general retail investors are just less, in some sense, maybe not cognitively, but uh, making mistakes and not realizing that they're choosing the wrong firms? All right, so there is a lot of controversy in the literature about whether or not the corporate governance metrics really tell us anything about firm, firm value, but let's just say hypothetically that having a higher score from ISS does tell us that the firms are more highly valued. So we do see retail investors as a, as a group segregating themselves into firms with lower CGQs than institutional in, in investors. So if we were to believe that a higher corporate governance score leads to higher firm value, then yes, we'd say that retail investors are making a, a mistake. Now the flip side though is they're in firms that have more exposure to the market for corporate control. And so in some sense, that's a substitute method for managerial discipline. 
The problem is their very presence, they being the retail investors, actually says even though in theory they're exposed to the market for a corporate control, you being there and you being loyal actually, actually makes it less likely that the market for corporate control is going to operate the way that it's supposed to. And so we do have reason to think that even though retail investors have, have found firms which in theory are going to be more susceptible to takeover attempts, their, their very presence makes that less likely, which, which is again another form of a mistake because they're being loyal when they in theory should let the market for corporate control work the way it's supposed to. But this again assumes the fact that we think the market for corporate control is a good thing. So there are people on both sides of that debate. Um, and there are those who actually think it's good for managers to have the ability to put poison pills in, in, into place, to have staggered boards, to have other means to actually, de to actually deter hostile acquisitions, because it gives managers more time to focus on the long term and to improve long term <laughs> share, shareholder value, even if in the short term you might get a higher, higher premium. So I guess to, to answer your questions, we have to be willing to make some assumptions about what corporate governance metrics tell us about firm value, as well as whether or not we always think it's good for firms to be exposed to the market for corporate control. I guess I'm, I'm asking something what interests me here is that something even more basic about how the map here divides. How is it possible that retail investors behave differently than institutional investors? <coughs> what make, you know, if it's clear, you know, these are you know, multi-billion, if not trillion dollar markets, um, and uh, if money shifts, the most sophisticated parties shift their hundreds of billions one way, why are the somewhat less sophisticated, but these are not stupid consumers, right? Um, so the less sophisticated parties that also have billions and billions of dollars at stake don't do the same. Why are they kind of making these kind of uh, different judgments? Right, so one possibility could relate to information asymmetries, right? So I can only offer you theories. I don't know exactly what's causing this. But there's a possibility, as I mentioned earlier, that institutional investors just have better information about corporate governance quality. They not only can sort of see the raw data, but they know how it all fits together. Someone that hasn't taken mergers and acquisitions or that hasn't had exposure to, to markets over a long period of time may not be able to appreciate the way a staggered board can actually deter hostile, hostile bids. So even if you told retail investors these firms have a a staggered board, all that might mean to them is, oh, that means a third of the directors are up for election each year. They don't see how, how that translates in, into the fact that if you have a poison pill plus a staggered board, that means that unless a court orders the poison pill's redemption, which is highly unlikely, especially for a Delaware corporation, your only other option is actually the proxy contest route. And it takes you two election cycles before you can win a majority of the board of directors in order to be able to then redeem the poison pill. So it's not just sort of having the raw data, but maybe appreciating how all of this works together that we're more likely to see at the fund manager level than at a retail investor level. So information is part of it. Um, you're, you're sort of wondering, well, why aren't they just mimicking what the institutions do? Why don't I just follow what the institutions do? Re retail investors, as far as I, I can tell from the available research, they have all kinds of reasons. They have heuristics. They, you know, they sort of think about, they actually read blogs, and they actually respond to all kinds of rumors. But it's not clear to me that they just say, well, I just want to tag on with sort of what the institutions are doing, and that's my, in, that's my in, investment strategy. Those that simply want to do what the institutions do, they'll just put their money into a fund. Those retail investors that sort of think, well, I've got some hunch about this, right? I think this company is going somewhere. They probably don't spend that much time thinking about the presence of a staggered board and a poison pill. They think about their products and what kind of sales growth they might be able to achieve. And a rumor they heard about how this, this was going to be the next you know, blockbuster X, Y, or Z. So I just think their focus is different. And following an institution is not something that the go-it-alone retail investor really has in mind. To what extent is there data about retail investors participating in these proxy contests? Because like, is this really a reflection of retail investors' preference towards uh, the board management, or is it just a reflection of voting procedures, that you need a majority vote and that retail investors aren't voting, and so then it becomes you know, too difficult to just win the proxy vote? All right, so there have been studies done. They're a little bit dated, which actually look to the question of whether or not we see the presence of a managerial advantage in the face of shareholder dispersion. And so that was theory two, that 
I articulated. So there is evidence that, that actually shows the more widely dispersed your shareholder base, which is more likely to be the case when you have more small retail investors than block holders or large institutional in investors holding relatively larger uh, amounts. We do see that managers win those contests more, more often, which actually gives credence to the theory that, well, it's more difficult for insurgents to win with a widely, widely dispersed shareholder base that has to be um, convinced of a particular insurgent's point of view. And so I think your question is, well, then how do we know that it's not just managerial in advantage, ad, advantage structurally? How do we know how, how much of it is that versus how much of it is actually retail investor passivity? And so how much of it is retail investors just not returning their proxy cards at all, which actually, or not bothering to tender at all? And so that would be some great data to have. I'm actually working on another project where I'm actually trying to work with a proxy solicitation firm to actually get some data on retail versus institutional voting patterns, what percentage of their proxy cards are actually returned, you know, retail versus institutions, to give me some more insight about who's voting and how often and on what kinds of matters. And if I could try to get some information on tender offers, I'm not sure how easy that would actually be, that would tell me a lot about my third theory. You mentioned that <clears throat> there are times when we want to assume that exposure to the market for corporate control is a good thing. Um, what, what does the literature, <laughs> what is there data out there, or have you looked at sort of the differences between, you know, what the result is from that exposure to the market for corporate control, other than the fact that you said that presence of retail investors sort of mitigates that, mm -hmm. and internal corporate governance uh, policies that sort of support and, and how they both impact the overall governance of the firm and the value there. All right, so I'll, I'll see if I can try to answer this question um, and you can tell me whether I've been responsive or not. So the studies are all over the place and there are various theories. So with respect to internal corporate governance, we find generally that there's a reason for us to be very suspicious of the notion that internal governance policies influence firm value. So we see a couple of instances where there are relationships, but usually we actually say that there maybe are only a couple of areas that might actually matter. Most of these things don't matter at all. But the puzzle there is why do institutional investors pay for this, this, this information? Why do they give lip service to the fact that they care about this? Maybe it's marketing, we're not quite sure. But the evidence that's available right now leads us to be very skeptical that internal corporate governance practices actually lead to higher firm value. And, and, and I think that our best guess is that what works in one firm doesn't necessarily translate to another firm. So the idea that you get extra points for having a board that is majority independent, that might make sense in this firm but not in a different firm. The CGQ gives you extra points for having the optimal board size of between 6 and 15. Why that number? Are there other circumstances where it might make sense to have a smaller board versus a you know, larger board, you, you, you lose points for having a former CEO on the board because we're sort of worried about that person's influence, but maybe they could actually bring a lot to the, to, the, to the table. So one size fits all doesn't really work well. And so that's probably why we see different results with respect to whether or not internal governance practices work. So even though I'm focusing on this in this particular study, I'm pretty agnostic with, with respect to whether or not these internal governance metrics actually will improve firm value. So it's possible back in response to, to Professor Ben, ben Shahar's question is that maybe the retail investors know that this stuff doesn't actually matter at all and they are smarter than the institutions. That seems unlikely, but, but certainly that's one possibility. Now on exposure to the market for corporate control and, and external governance, the consensus or the leading view among academics appears to be that greater exposure to the market for corporate control is better. There have been a number of law professors who've done studies which actually show when a company has a poison pill in place and, and an effective staggered board in place, meaning a staggered board that's not easily dismantled, we find that it's much more difficult for hostile bids to actually succeed. And then they also show evidence that after that hostile bidder goes away, the company stock price sort of ticked up in, in, in anticipation of a hostile bid. After that hostile bidder disappears, the stock price trails down back to where it was previously, never to go back up to those higher, higher levels. And so they actually assume using, using this data that 
these types of devices actually dis actually dis dis actually destroy value. Now there have been studies which actually use the event study methodology to look at when a firm puts a particular corporate governance practice in place, a particular anti-takeover mechanism, how does the market react? The event studies there show that the market reaction is mixed. So if we have a situation where the firm is well governed by other metrics, like we think that we have a CEO whose interests are aligned with the shareholders and there's generally good governance in place, the market appears to be fine with it, either to have no reaction or a positive reaction. And there the theory is, if we have a good managerial team, we actually think that they're going to use the anti-takeover defenses in the most positive way that we can posit, which is to buy additional time for the management team. Poison pills can have a beneficial effect because it, it gives additional negotiating leverage to the target board of directors when they're dealing with a hostile bidder. So maybe they'll be able to extract higher value if we have a good management team in place. We see how, however, studies showing that when there's a bad management team in place, that you know, there's a negative stock price reaction to the announcement of, a, of, of an anti-takeover mechanism. And so, that's, so basically the data is all over the place. And I'm not sure if that was your question or, okay. <laughs> there any other questions? Well, seeing none, thank you all very much.